Good morning, it's Miss Lisa. I have today with me a very large jar and I also have my Bible. If you have your Bible, why don't you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter two, verses one through 11. That's gonna be our scripture for the day. It's about a wedding. On the third day, there was a wedding it took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you bring this me into this? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do what he tells you. Six stone water jars stood nearby. The Jews used to use water from that type, type of jar for special washings to make themselves pure. Each jar could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the top. Then he told them, now dip some out and take it to the person in charge of the dinner. They did what he said. The person in charge tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, but the servants who had brought the water knew. Then the person in charge called the groom to one side. He said to him, everyone brings out the best wine first. They bring out the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best until now. That was the first of Jesus's mir miraculous signs. He did it at Cana in Galilee. Jesus showed his glory by doing it and his disciples put their faith in him. Evan is going to give us a little lesson about what that might have looked like turning water into wine. Thank you, Evan. Good job. So why do you think Jesus wanted to do a miracle, his very first miracle, at a wedding? Weddings are fun and full of dancing and celebration. And is that, is that how we sometimes think of Jesus? Or do we think of Jesus as quiet, prayerful, just really not very exciting? Well, I'm here to tell you that he is exciting and he is fun and he wants, he created us that way and we're made in his image. So invite him into the celebrations of your life. Invite him into the fun parts and not just the quiet, prayerful parts. Pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for turning that water into wine and making it overflow like your love for us. In your name, we pray it. Amen. Thanks so much, Evan, and we will see you all next week.
Hi, I'm Russ Adams, the pastor at Western Reserve, and before I set up the sermon for today, uh, let me give you a few prayer concerns. We want to continue to pray for Terry Himes, who's recovering from all of his chemo, and he's making some progress. Uh, Bill Helzel. Uh, Bill Helzel has, is in rehab now, so he's been discharged from the hospital, which is great news. Uh, the same with Matthew Powell, and both of those gentlemen were dealing with the coronavirus at one time. Uh, I can also tell you that Shirley Myers had surgery and she is in rehab. She moved yesterday and she's at Greenbrier. And uh, I can tell you that Mary Kay Kunzman had knee surgery earlier this week, did very well, and is at home uh, doing rehab. Uh, also, I'm going to ask that we pray for uh, Marion Zicka, who's the sister, Anne, uh, who was diagnosed with cancer for the fourth time. Uh, obviously, we're praying for those people that have the coronavirus, those that are fighting the coronavirus, and those that are truly terrified of the coronavirus. And yet in spite of all that, this is Mother's Day weekend, and if you want to do a little bit of history and dig into it, what you find is that the American Mother's Day can actually be traced back to a death. Uh, it was a death in 1905 of Anna Reese Jarvis. Uh, she was truly loved by her daughter Anna M. Jarvis, and Anna wanted to make sure that her mother and all mothers were appreciated. And so she began, uh, shortly after her mother's death, to, to work on what she would consider to be a Mother's Day to celebrate motherhood. Uh, Anna lived uh, with her mother in, in, in Grafton, West Virginia. And her mother had been a Sunday school teacher for 20 years, and so she thought the church would be a, a great place to go. And so she went to the superintendent of Sunday schools at the St. Andrew's Methodist Church and suggested the fact that they would take a day and they would celebrate all mothers. Uh, her mother had taught for those 20 years, and so certainly permission was given. 
And she decided to have for the very first Mother's Day on her mother's anniversary, on her mother's birthday, May the 10th, 112 years ago today. It was a big success. 407 people came, and she made sure that every woman that came got one white carnation, because a white carnation was her mother's favorite flower. And if you happen to be a mother, then you got two carnations. Uh, the word spread fast, and, and by the time they began to look around, they began to realize that a lot of states were already participating in a, a Mother's Day ceremony. And by 1912, uh, West Virginia became the first state to make uh, Mother's Day a, a, a state holiday. And in 1914, Woodrow Wilson signed into law that Mother's Day should be the second Sunday in May uh, for the country. Uh, Mother's Day is a, a great day in America, but it's certainly not an American holiday. Uh, motherhood is celebrated around the world. In Britain, uh, they call Mother's Day Mothering Day. And in former Soviet bloc countries, uh, they take March the 8th, the first day of spring, and they call it International Women's Day. In the Arab world, it's observed on May the, the 21st. And in Argentina, Mother's Day is celebrated on the third Sunday in October. Armenia, it's April the 7th. And, and in Paraguay, they are celebrated on May the 15th, their Independence Day. And America is one of 85 countries around the world that celebrate Mother's Day on the second Sunday in May. So what I want to do today is I, I want to look at a piece of scripture from the second chapter of John. And what I want to do with that chapter is look at the relationship between Jesus and Mary. I've called this message today uh, a mother's influence. But before I begin, I, I want to make a, a, a confession. And my confession is that even though I write over 50 sermons a year, it's this sermon that I struggle the most with. I struggle with Mother's Day sermons not because I had a bad mother, I had a wonderful mother. And the truth is that even though she's been gone for years now, I think I miss her more now than on the day that she died. And so I want you to listen to the scripture, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to be sensitive to the fact that it's the relationship between a mother and her adult son. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then when the, the cheaper wine after the guests have been too much to drink. But you saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, as we come here today, we're thankful for this opportunity of gathering with you. Uh, and and we, have, we are in your presence, we have to make those confessions uh, we confess that we're not perfect. Uh, we we'll confess that, that we're, we're tired of all the negativity of our time. And we'll confess it that our own death bothers us. And for those three basic reasons, we all need Jesus in our lives. 
Uh, we hunger for forgiveness, and that comes from Jesus. Uh, we hunger for a better world, and we know that's possible through Jesus. And we'll admit it that, that, that our own death does bother us, but we have this great opportunity of eternal life because of this relationship with Jesus. And so once again, I just ask that you just pour the gift of preaching through me that through my simple words, we may experience your word so we can apply those words to our daily lives. Once again, we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. We find ourselves today in the second chapter of John, and the story is only found in John. It is not found in Matthew, it's not found in Mark, it's not found in Luke. However, that does not diminish the significance of the story. Everybody knows about Jesus' first miracle in Canaan. The, the, the setting is a, is a wedding reception. And in our time, couples just married run off to exotic places to honeymoon. They may go to parts of Mexico or the Caribbean or, or Hawaii. Not so in Jesus' day. They didn't go away, but their receptions lasted longer than ours. Their wedding reception lasted about a week. Now, i got to say this. Uh, my daughter, Anna, is getting married in, in a few months, and I'm glad that her wedding reception will last a few hours. I cannot afford to hold a week-long wedding reception. But I will say this. In that week-long reception, there had to have been an awful lot of partying. And obviously, there was an awful lot of drinking. According to the story, Jesus is invited to this wedding reception, and he's invited to their wedding reception, and I'd like to say because he was a fun guy. The truth is, he was invited to the wedding reception because he was a respected rabbi. It is while Jesus is at this reception that the unthinkable happens. It's one of those things that doesn't change with time. You never want your guests to go home hungry, and you never want your guests not to have a drink. Somebody spreads the word. Somewhere in this wedding reception, the wine ran out. And I'm sure that those that were responsible for the wedding reception look for the guilty party, but that's not the story with Mary. She looks to Jesus. And she knows that Jesus has this ability to save the day. She looks at Jesus, encourages Jesus, you know, you can do this, let's do it. Jesus is uncomfortable at this point. Verse 4 says, quoting Jesus, My time has not yet come. Being a true mother, she doesn't listen to Jesus' words. She calls for water to be brought in, and the miraculous takes place. All those gallons of water are suddenly turned into wine, and not just the cheap wine. The good wine. What's that mean? It means it's the wine with a kick. Today I don't want to talk about wine, but, but what I want to talk about is the importance of motherhood. And you know the truth, motherhood does not just end when a child begins school, and it doesn't just end when your child gets your driver's license or begins to pay their own bills. Motherhood is one of those things that never ends and that always has unfinished business. So don't fool yourself. I don't care how old your children are, they still need you. Jesus is 30 years old in the story and he still needed his mother. And I've wrapped this message around three words. Each word is illustrated by Mary in the story and yet it's not really words for those of us that have children. It's really words for anyone that has relationships with people in their lives. I believe that these three words would really enhance any relationship in your life. So let's look at the three. Okay, first of all, uh, Mary needed a, a word of encouragement. Okay, Jesus is 30 years old in the story and yet she still needs to encourage him. Uh, the master was hesitant, you know, to get started in his ministry. Mary knew that it was time. A and she encourages Jesus to do something 
because it's the best for him. Mothers spend their lives, I know that it's true, encouraging their, their children. They encourage their children when they're little to take their first step. You know, they, they encourage their children on that first day of school when the child is hesitant to go to school. They encourage their children when they're adults maybe to, to start that new business or, or get that advanced degree. The world is always telling us that we cannot do things and why we can't do things, highlighting our imperfections. Mothers are great at encouraging us to simply do our best. When you encourage somebody, what you're saying is that I believe in you. Have you ever needed a word of encouragement? When was the last time you encouraged someone? Mothers need to encourage, but also mothers need to envision. Um, Mary really had an unfair advantage. She had all those memories of, of, of Jesus' birth tucked away in her heart and in her mind. Uh, she knew that God had a, a special plan for his life, and she knew that there was much more to Jesus than his vocation being a carpenter. She knew that Jesus could be more. And so she encourages Jesus so that she shows that Jesus will evolve into something different. I think that, that mothers need to envision what their children can be. I grow weary of, of people who are always talking about their kids when they were little, and all they do is, is highlight the negative side. I know they could have done better in math in high school, you know. I know they could have been more respectful when they were teenagers. I know that when the divorce came along, it brought shame to the whole family, but just evolve and let your children involve. When you look at your children, do you see what they were, or do you look at your children and see what they could become? Let me give you some pastoral advice. If you're just worrying about what your children were, move on and move forward. Let those things in the past be in the past and let them evolve. They have the license to evolve and tap into the potential that is in all of their hearts. When you look at your children, do you look into the future? Mothers need to envision. But also mothers need to, to prepare their children for eternity. Um, we are constantly reminded by the news now about all the people that have died because of the, the coronavirus. I looked up the sad numbers the other day. Uh, over 250,000 people have died around the world from complications caused by the coronavirus. 72,000, over 72,000 have died within the United States from complications caused by the coronavirus. And we spend hours worrying about finding a cure and a vaccination and all the money that we have put into it. I've heard a lot about vaccinations and cures. And I don't want to take this to an ugly low level, but nobody seems to be worrying about the salvation of the people who have died. Just think about it for a moment. Over 72,000 Americans have died and nobody seems to be too worried about their salvation. I believe if one person was missing from heaven, it would change the experience for me. And I think that if one of my loved ones, I know it's true, wasn't in heaven, it, it, it would change the experience for me. And I do not know, honestly, how you could enjoy heaven if your children were not there. Mothers prepare their children for eternity. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I am not saying that these things are like bullet points in a sermon or, or in, a, in a meeting or in an agenda. It, it isn't like you encourage, you know, it isn't like you envision, it, it isn't like you, you know, prepare them for eternity and check those things off like they're done. They're never done. And those are the themes of, of, of Christian motherhood that, that are lived out for a lifetime. And those three things are woven through the fabric of the relationship between a mother and their children. 
It isn't like you're done with those things because you're always doing those things. Uh, the wise one, Solomon, he got it. 22nd chapter of Proverbs said, Start your children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. We need to live those themes in our lives with the children in our lives. And we'll change them. I know we will, because that's my story. Uh, my mother, her name was Ruth, and she was born in, in Brooklyn, New York. And she was the oldest of two daughters to Walter and Nina Milligan. And they lived in one of those brownstones side by side uh, near old Ebbets Field. Uh, she went to PS 92 as an elementary student. She went to Erasmus Hall High School, you know, as a high school student. Now, in her day, women were not encouraged to go on and get a, a better education, but my mom didn't listen. She knew, and she was encouraged really by her parents, to go on and continue to get an education. And so my mother, instead of living at home or, or whatever, enrolled at, at, at Pratt Institute in New York City, and she studied dietetics during those dark days of, of World War II. And she always would tell us it would be hard to study during those blackouts. When she graduated from college, everybody just assumed, because this is what was expected, that women would move back home. But my mother didn't move back home. She got her own place. She moved to Jersey City, New Jersey. And she worked at a hospital. And after long days of working in the hospital, she found herself going back to school to work on her master's degree. However, she never finished that master's degree because her life changed one night. On that night, she put her studies to the side and she put her work to the side and she decided to go to a social gathering at the, at the Barbell Collegiate Church. The Second World War had just ended and they were in more innocent times. Uh, young soldiers who were returning home, now civilians, were encouraged to come to these dances and meet young women. And my mother went to one of those dances and met a lot of young men in those particular days, all veterans. On that night, she met a dark-haired, dark-complected man from Ohio. And, and the truth is that she wasn't really interested in him at first because of his dark hair and dark complexion. She thought he was Italian, which meant that he was Roman Catholic, and since she was, he was Roman Catholic and she wasn't, she wasn't interested. And then she found out a piece of information that changed her life. He wasn't Catholic. He was a Protestant. And he was studying at the New York School of Interior Design. And they began to date. And in time, he would propose to her. And in time, they would get married. And in time, she would leave New York City. And she would go back, to come to Ohio. And his job located him to Warren. At first they lived in a small apartment until their, their, their twin daughters were born and then they moved to a house and, and years later their, their, their son was born. It's funny, my mom always worked and my mom was one of those first century career women and we all knew that she was a dietitian but my sisters and I will tell you that, that we knew that we were her greatest priority my mom was always encouraging us. My mom was always preparing us both for this world and for heaven itself. My dad always called my mom a big city woman. And my mom always believed in her heart that, that they would celebrate their 50th anniversary together. It never happened. When my dad died in 1960, 1996, my mom really did not do well. Uh, she stayed on their home on the east side of, of Warren, and she never adjusted to being alone. Oh, family members would come occasionally and, and, and visit her. You know, she would fly out to Colorado and visit my sister Janet occasionally. And, and the truth is that, that my sister and I, Susan, we would go and we'd have lunch with her every single Wednesday. 
I don't have really pleasant memories of those lunches, really because every week we could see my mother was in decline. The independent young woman that bucked the system and got an education and got a job had sort of grown paranoid. And it was sad to witness. The day came when we all admitted she couldn't live alone anymore. Uh, she moved to Copeland Oaks. And in Copeland Oaks, she started off an apartment. And after a while, that didn't go so well. And for a couple days, she was in assisted living, and that really didn't go well. In the end, she ended up in the nursing home. And my sister Susan and I would take turns, and we would go over, and we would visit her several times a week. And every time she saw us, she begged us, just begged us to get her out of there. We didn't have any other option. She had to be there, and it's the best that we could do. By the spring of 2002, things were really bad. My sister and I would go every day. We'd take turns, and we'd try to be there at night so she would never be alone. We knew she was dying, and people asked me, what's your mom dying from? I'd always just tell her what I understood. She was dying of a broken heart. And one night I was there, and it was near the end of her life. And when I first got there, it was sunny outside and, and it was bright. But as the time went on and the TV was off, it would get darker outside, so it got darker in her room, she was asleep. And when I first got there, I thought about my childhood and all the things that we did that were fun. And I thought about all the things she had done for me. When it was completely dark outside, I began to think about everything that I had to do the next day. And so I, I stood up to leave. But before I did, I, I leaned over and I kissed my mother on her forehead. And I uttered those three words I wish I would have said years earlier. I love you. And in a moment of clarity, I don't know where the source came from, where the power came from. My mother suddenly snapped too. And she looked at me and she would said, I would hope so. I'm your mother. And I got to tell you, I'm a better person because she was. My mom knew the truth. She was not a perfect person. My mom knew disappointment. And my mom made mistakes. She would confess it, and we all would. But this is also the truth. We're better people because she was our mother. And she taught us the most valuable things in life, not by a lecture, but by the life that she lived. She was always encouraging. And she was always preparing us, both for this world and for eternity. Solomon was not wrong. He said, start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. That's how I remember my mother. How will you be remembered? Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, as we come here today, we're, we're, we recognize that motherhood, family life, parenting has all become very complicated in our times and we all need those people in our lives uh, that are encouraging we all need those people in our lives that are preparing us uh, both for the things in this world our future in this world but also preparing us for eternity so once again may we cherish the role that we have with the people in our lives and may we be people who be remembered as improving others. Once again, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would Oh,
his love for me who the sun sets free oh it's free indeed I'm a child of God yes I His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Child. 